So I guess I'll uh, introduce myself a bit. So my name is Dmitry. I guess some of you guys know me. I've been doing some stuff in the closure web space for a few years now. Um, I actually work at the University Health Network in Toronto. And my team works kind of on internal hospital applications. We make stuff for clinicians and kind of like fill those workflows that can be filled with commercial products. So a lot of the stuff is kind of custom development. Mostly web apps and services, stuff like that. And uh, we started using Clojure about four years ago. And we started by kind of doing some internal tools for ourselves to kind of test it out, see how much we like it, if the team was comfortable with that. And it turned out to be really liked it. We found it to be incredibly productive for us. So then we kind of decided we'll start moving out and actually making applications with that. And a lot of my projects kind of come out of my work. For example, I have that cell JPDF library for report generation. And then I wrote Selmer for doing HTML templates on Markdown CLJ for dealing with Markdown and stuff. And what I found, like when we started four years ago, a lot of the stuff just didn't exist. So you had this fantastic language and a great platform, but the libraries weren't quite there. And a lot of times it was really hard to figure out how to do stuff. Because there was a few books on closure, but there was no books on like web development or anything like that. And that made it really tricky to actually get bootstrapped. So once I realized that, I, that's kind of where Luminous came from, right? Because there was a big drive in the Clojure community to do everything using libraries and not use frameworks for anything. And it's really powerful, right? Because it puts like developer completely in control. You don't have to figure out what somebody else was thinking to fit your workflow into somebody else's model. You can take the libraries, put them together, and now you have your app just the way you want it. But the thing people don't really mention is that in order to be able to do that, you really have to have a lot of understanding about the ecosystem and the libraries. So if somebody is a beginner and they're just coming to closure, you know, they have no idea what libraries to use, how to interact with each other, um, how to put them together, you know, what small maintain and so on, right? And that's where I realized there was really kind of a niche for creating a template that was batteries included. And then you set up all the common tasks you have in a typical web application, like session management, login, internal socialization, and so on. And you kind of pull together all the libraries that are well maintained, play nicely with each other. And now, you know, when you, make, you want to make a new web app, you just go, lay new Luminous My App, and off you go, and now it works. And then you can kind of figure out the specifics as you go. So that removes a lot of that uh, contention there for new users. And I kind of didn't really look at Clojure script seriously until last year, because I play with it, but every time I tried it, it was like, yeah, it's kind of cool. You know, I get to use the same language on both the front end and the back end. But at the end of the day, JavaScript has so much more tooling around it. There's so much more support. You can debug it. And I really didn't see the much value in it. Like even when I wrote my book, uh, Dr. was Closure last year, I kind of have a brief section at the end that, yeah, hey, Closure script exists, you know, you can use it, but I'm not really using it. <laughs> and what really changed it for me is when React came out. Because I looked at React and I was like, wow, this is genius, right? I mean, this is what people have been doing kind of like it's now analog of what people do in games with double buffering, right? You render all your stuff in the background, and then you update your screen once, and then everything is smooth, and you don't have to worry about stuff flickering in and out and repainting and so on. And React kind of takes the same approach, right? Like, they'll use a virtual DOM, we paint everything in the virtual DOM in the background, and then let React figure out what actually needs to be painted on the screen. I was like, that's awesome. I want to use that. So then I started playing with React, and I found, yeah, it's kind of awesome, but once you get into more complicated stuff, you have a lot of components, you have a lot of state, and you have to pass it between the components. Then it starts getting kind of crafty again. And I was like, okay, well, I've heard really cool stuff about ARM. Everybody's using ARM in the Clojure community. And it's built in React, so maybe ARM is pretty awesome. So then I go and I try ARM, and I did a spike with it for a project. And I found, yeah, it's better than React, but it's not, it didn't blow me away. Like, 
It was nice, but it still exposed a lot of the underlying React functionality to the user. And it felt like I was doing some incidental stuff with on, right? Like you have to reapply things, uh, you have to pass nulls around and so on. And I was like, okay, um, you know, it's near, but it didn't really click with me. And to be fair, like today, OM has a lot of tooling around it. There's like OM tools, uh, there's Kio and Sablono for doing templating from. So it's kind of like catching up there. And I mean, like the way I used it initially, it's not really fair today, but it didn't really click, so I went looking for something else. And something else was reagent. And I mean, like, I used it for 15 minutes. I was like, this is how I develop applications from now on. <laughs> like, there's no going back for me. And of course, I mean, there was the same problem, right? Like, how do you set up a closure script project? And again, right, like, you have this lane CLGS build and Kels are key configurations, and you go Google for how to configure your app. And you try to build it for production, and you enable the advanced compiler, and all of a sudden your app doesn't work anymore. And we've probably all been there, like anybody who's played with Closure Script, right? And it kind of gets frustrating. You don't really want to be doing it all the time. So I was like, yeah, reagent is awesome, but who's going to use it if you know if it's that difficult to get started on? And that kind of what gave me that motivation to do reagent template. I already haven't done the stuff with Luminous template. I kind of like knew where I wanted to take it. There was also like the chestnut template for OM, which was pretty successful, and that made OM more popular. Like, okay, Reagent did something like that. And that's basically where that came from. So I don't know how many of you guys actually use the Reagent template or are familiar with it? Okay. <laughs> Two people? <laughs> Excellent. So basically, it's nothing special, right? Like, uh, how many of you guys know how uh, Lane Gen templates work in general? Uh, what, what kind a little of bit? Line, line, line. Oh, line templates, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's actually pretty simple, right? The idea is that uh, the templates in, in line uses stencil, and you basically write out your files, it does some pre processing on them, injects stuff into them, and creates your project. So, there is nothing really too special going on. For reagent templates, the only funky part is. I have an option for CLGX if you want to cross compile stuff. But otherwise, it's a really basic template. And I guess we can go over it a bit right now. I'll share my uh, light table with you guys. And I'll kind of just walk you through what all the libraries I included and kind of where stuff lives on it. And then maybe you guys can like feel free to ask me questions too, right? So again, we can keep it a bit interactive. <laughs> So let me jump in. Uh, can you guys see my screen? Black. Yeah, there, there is. Is. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so here's kind of like the top level of the template, right? And let me just go through all the different stuff in it. So the environment sets up uh, different environments for development and production. And that kind of allows us to basically run stuff that we might want to inject during the dev cycle that we don't want to use in prod cycle. And I totally stole this idea from the chestnut template from. And it works really well. So for dev, we have the closure dev part, which starts up with the Figual server and the browser REPL. And then we have the REPL, because I guess like, if people are writing stuff from Emacs or whatever, then you don't actually have to run it from the terminal to stuff like normally you would do. Um, Lane ring server to start, start up your app. So this way you can just do it from here. And for CLGS, we have the basic bootstrap for closure script namespaces. And that's going to connect Figwheel and enable console printing. And then it's going to call the init from our core namespace that gets generated for each project. And for prod, we just have the same thing, except we don't do the Figwheel stuff. And I disable the pprint functionality, so then if you have any print lens enabled, they'll just get ignored in the prod. So it'll actually run an IE out of the box. Um, and aside from that, so that nothing too special going on there. Then resources have basically our CSS and a kind of basic template that will include stuff for prod and dev. And then in the source, we have the handler. And the handler sets up our basic routes for composure and bootstraps our middleware and decides you know, if we're in development cycle or not. 
And after that, we have the CLGX stuff that gets enabled based on the profile. And that's because I think a basic test, it should compile in theory. Um, also mostly inspired by the chestnut one. And then we have the project file that has a lot of stuff in it, which hopefully you mostly don't have to worry about on this other project. So for dependencies, I chose to go with um, reagent forms. I don't know if any of you guys use that. Okay, so for the rest of you guys, it's basically at the end came out from work because I found myself often creating common components, right? And every time you make a reagent component, you want to capture its output, bind its view to the atom, right? And you just keep doing it over and over. I'm like, you know, this really could be abstracted into something. And that's how I decided to just create its components where you, it knows how to bind itself to the atom and you use the field tag to define the type of component and then the rest is really left up to the user, so it doesn't affect your layout or anything. Like it's really kind of agnostic about that. Um, the other one is reagent utils, and the main thing I use from there is there's cookies, there's stuff for doing currency stuff. There's um, I created a session which I ported from Libnar session, which I really like. Because it's, yeah. Uh, can you increase your font size? Uh, yes. Sorry about that. Um, for the people that on Periscope, right? Or just in the is that more Not much better. Did okay, uh, let's see what we can do. Is that better? A little bit. Is there any way for us to share the screen? Is that a Google Hangout thing that's keeping it small? Or I don't know. I'm sure you could we might have to. command plus, right? Uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm increasing it. Uh, I can't see, unfortunately, you guys are seeing that. It it's a little bit bigger, yeah. Is it bigger? Okay. Um, is it still readable? Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, cool. Excellent. So, I guess, yeah, so that's the reagent forms. Reagent utils is basically kind of helper functions. A closure script is self explanatory. Um, I don't know, I'm getting a bit of flicker. All right. Uh, so, ring defaults is a really nice thing that James Reeves made. And basically, it combines a whole bunch of common ring middleware together that you always end up including. So you have like CSRF protection and all the session management. And I find that stuff is really fiddly if you set it up by hand. So it's really nice to have something that ensures the order of your middleware is correct and everything is set up correctly. So very handy. Um, Tron is really nice for development. And it will take any server errors and actually display them in the browser, give you the line numbers. It's pretty fantastic. Uh, Selmer is the templating engine. And I'm actually trying with idea was maybe just removing it and using hiccups since you're already using a hiccup style syntax on this client. It might probably make sense to just give them the server as well. And then really your whole app is in closure. You don't see HTML at that point. And secretary is used for routing. And environment is used to do any environment variables. So then we have some plugins, um, mostly self explanatory. I'm using Lane Ring to manage the ring server in development. And then the asset minifier kind of compiles all the CSS assets uh, for production and minifies them. Then Ring is just uh, specifies the Uber bar name if you create some wires, select your handler. Um, Uber your name, that's kind of self-explanatory. Then, let's see what else we got. Clean targets are needed for a closure script, because uh, our CLGS build. So the latest version just goes through lane clean, and lane clean won't clean out non-closure assets, so you have to specify a special tag for that. And the assets for the minifier, and then we have the default build for closure uh, script. And nothing too exciting in here except, I guess, CLGX build paths that you need if you're doing CLGX compilation. And then we have our REPL option for uh, starting piggyback, and that's needed for FigReal to be able to push the code live and create a browser REPL. And I guess, yeah, we're into profiles now, right? So those stuff only happens for your dev profile. And we're doing production, none of those stuff gets included for you. So it's just a bunch of dependencies and libraries and stuff. 
Um, the injections produce better uh, test output because the default test from Clojure doesn't really give you anything readable. And the fig wheel basically is the generic fig wheel setup. Uh, then we have the CLGX, which needs a few more options. I'm not going to go too deep into it unless you guys really want me to. And finally, we have the Uber jar that gets compiled for production. So that's kind of it for the template. Um, do you guys have any specific questions about that? Or kind of self explanatory for the most part? It's actually uh, pretty solid work you know, from the look of it, but it's also overwhelming in, num in terms of the number of. Uh, you know, uh, libraries and plugins that go into the, uh, right. the making of And I mean, that, that's kind of the painful part I'm trying to help people kind of get over, right? That you don't really have to figure out how to get all that stuff included yourself. Right. And hopefully once you have the template working, right, and you have a, something special you need to do, you can kind of work from it what to do and how to change it. Does, it, does your, um, do you have a readme that it, explains the Justification and, and uh, use of some of this stuff. And you could obviously go look at all that. Right? Yeah, no, I haven't. Uh, unfortunately, yeah, that's kind of like a failing on my part. I really haven't made a big review on why everything is there. Uh, I do have like the readme kind of explains how to use it, but not why it's made the way it is. Uh, a lot of it is kind of, I would say, incidental to the developer, right? Aside from the dependencies in the top list, the rest of the stuff you pretty much would never have to touch unless you were doing something really funky. Um, also, a lot of what too is worth noting is changing fairly rapidly. Like, Figwheel changed quite a bit in probably like last two, three months. So, it's actually a bit of effort just keeping up with that. Like, the Clojure script REPL stuff got a lot better nowadays, right? That's, it, I kind of, I'm almost hesitant to try to invest too much time in documenting because three months from now it's probably going to be all different anyways. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to wait till it uh, kind of stabilizes a bit and people give a better, a better target to work with. But for now the main goal is kind of to make it easy to jump into and actually start making culture script apps that work. <laughs> also, um, worth mentioning, I guess I can stop the the other thing I want to mention is that I also added the three agent stuff to Luminous as well. So if you use plus CLGS profile there, it'll basically do similar stuff to the reagent template, but you also get all the stuff the Luminous template includes, right? So you have like session management, databases. The reagent template is fairly spartan in that regard. Uh, and intentionally so, because I didn't really want to be opinionated. I already have one opinionated template. So this one's kind of like, here's the really basic stuff, and then you go nuts and figure out what you want to do with it. Um, the other thing I actually want to mention that's kind of unrelated to the template itself is the reagent cookbook that's under the reagent project on GitHub. And Matthew Jody has been um, spearheading that. And it's absolutely fantastic, right? Because it has a ton of little simple recipes on how you know how do you do blobs reagent. And a lot of time it's really, really handy, right? Because as soon as you start doing a serious project, you're probably gonna start using JavaScript libraries. And they probably want to manipulate DOM, and the DOM has to be mounted, and that's where you get into those scenarios. It's like, so how do I tell if my component is mounted, right? How, when do I run the specific JavaScript and how do I get the actual mounted node? And that really illustrates how to do it really well because they're really self contained, focused examples, and just go and read that, and it's really helpful. So, I definitely recommend checking that out. So, I guess that's kind of um, it for the stuff I had. Um, do you guys have any feedback, questions, comments? Yeah, actually, can you can you show us an app built with very with reagent templates? Is there a, a public um, a public app? I don't have one handy. I have a few apps like I have for work, but they're not public. Um, closest thing would be my vlog engine that I'm no longer using. But that one's on GitHub. I can post a link after the setup, after the meetup. And I mean, it is kind of representative of what I'm doing now. 
So some of the stuff changed, like uh, I think I'm doing Ajax by hand there using the Google uh, Closure Ajax instead of using still just Ajax. Now I switched to using that because it actually works really well. Um, it also illustrates stuff for how to do, for example, stuff like file uploads for your agent, mm -hmm. how to set up your pages, how to manage global state and so on. So I would say it's still fairly representative of how I build maps right now. So if you kind of want to get a window into that, uh, you can look at that one. Uh, if I end up open sourcing anything from work, I'll definitely add to some links for that. But I'm actually, yeah, kind of like most of the stuff I work on is closed source. So I can't share it just yet. <laughs> Okay, one, one other follow-up question. I mean, it would be really nice to see uh, the link once you post that and uh, get into it. Uh, the other question is, I noticed you have React uh, uh, 113, um, the latest version of React, and the uh, dependencies. How is, how is that interacting with the React that's uh, being uh, pulled in by reagents? Um, good question, actually. <laughs> so, uh, from, as I recall, if I recall, correctly. I should, I'm not actually sure the overrates or not. You know what? Um, I'm hoping it does. I'm not 100% certain of that. Because I know Reagent does its own thing, but my understanding is Reagent internally actually just does the externs for React, for the functions it uses. Mm -hmm. I don't think the actual Reagent library includes the full uh, reactor it uses. Uh, it used to do it as a preamble. I have to check if 0.5 still does or not. Right. That's, that's, in that's interesting, something to look into. Uh, the other thing is, are you open to us forking Reagent template into Reagent template light? Something that would- Yes, absolutely. Uh, in a, fact, like, uh, like forking those PRs, everything is definitely very welcome. Like even if uh, you guys have suggestions for making lighter and removing stuff that you know, it's not really generally useful that I thought was useful. I'm definitely open to that. Uh, also, like the other option is to make kind of profiles, right? Have like plus light profile that just does a bare bones thing and then build from there. But I'm definitely open to any and all forking and suggestions and feedback. I'm kind of learning this stuff as I go as well. <laughs> I mean, especially stuff with closure script, right? Because I think pretty much everybody in closure community is still experimenting with what's the best way to do it. And anybody who's actually using it and you know building apps and has feedback from doing production things, it's really, really valuable. Do you guys have any other questions? I could keep going. <laughs> um, I'd actually, if, if you have a chance, can you speak briefly about uh, your book that's coming out this summer? Um, is that going to involve reagent and uh, what kind of issue? Yes, absolutely. So, yeah, so my book, I can, I've been talking with my editor actually late last year, and they suggested, you know, that might be time for second edition, so I kind of looked at the state of the closure ecosystem and stuff, and the web stuff, and it, yeah, a lot changed, right? Like, in the last, in the past year, I think the ecosystem matured quite a bit. And the new book addresses a lot of stuff the old book didn't, and a lot of it was based on the feedback I got from the first edition. Uh, the biggest changes, I'm, and I mean, that's kind of related to luminous changes as well, that in the first edition, I didn't really feel comfortable recommending one specific way to do things. So the style of the book was, here's how you do it one way, but here's how you do it another way, and here's how you do it another way, and you decide what's right for you. Uh, this time, I'm just going with luminous as the base, and it's, it lets it be a little more focused, so instead of doing different ways to do the same thing, I'm gonna focus on how to do the one thing better, to do it one way. And Reagent does play a, kind of like a major part of that, cause the original book was mostly server-side templating. New Edition does a little bit of server-side, but quickly moves into uh, single page apps. And the major app that gets developed towards the end is kind of like, I'm still in the picture gallery app, but this time it's all on the client side, it's gonna be all Reagent. So you'll really get to see how Reagent interacts with the service side. And I'm gonna use Composure API for the services, cause I think it's absolutely fantastic. I highly recommend using it if you aren't. It's really the best thing since sliced bread in my opinion. <laughs> the main thing I like about Composure API, just to qualify it, is that it uses prismatic schema to define your API endpoints, right? 
And that does two things. Like, A, you get documentation out of the box. So when you come back to it six months later, you know, you know what your API actually looks like, what parameters are, what their types are. It can do coercions for you. So then you can actually, uh, if you're working with, say, JSON and JavaScript on the front end, you can transfer between your JavaScript while using your EDN notation, using schema. And the other big part that it does, it allows you to check how to generate documentation, right? So you end up with this page that has your full API in it that's statically generated, and you can give it to people and say, here's the API for my app, go nuts. And like to me, it's like having whistles without the pain of suffering through soap. And if anybody ever uses soap, you'll understand why you never want to use it again. <laughs> So that's kind of the focus for the book. So it's got to be basically reagent, um, single page apps, um, a lot of more stuff on databases, integrations, deployment. I'm going to cover a little bit of how to front your app with Nginx this time around, and really kind of hopefully give end to end of start your app, build your app, deploy your app to service, be happy. So hopefully that kind of answers it. <laughs> So Dmitry, before we let you go, can you, after the meetup, uh, post your GitHub uh, repo as well? So we can- Yeah, absolutely. So I'm kind of post all the like stuff for Luminous Reagent, uh, my GitHub profile, and where I have some projects on there. Great. And anything else I guess of interest? <laughs> Actually, I have a question. Yeah, sure. Um, have you checked out Reframe at all? Or what are you um, Very briefly, I'm actually very curious to See a presentation on it and how it works. Because I haven't like, um, I guess I haven't really had time to really spike up a project with it. I know some people have been using it. Uh, the feedback seems to be really good from what I've seen. It seems pretty solid, but I haven't really had time to play with it yet. Seriously. Uh, but I guess are you, are you, are you guys using it? Uh, not not at loyal three, but he's. Yeah, not, I actually yeah. use it uh, on a project. Uh, it's kind of a medium sized project. Uh, it worked out pretty good for me so far, uh, so I. Feel so, what do you find like uh, the key benefits from Reframe over just playing React, I guess, for region? So I'm, I'm a good person to ask because I'm on like a V2 of the same site almost or a similar site. So, oh, yeah, so, so the first time, I, uh, I was kind of a, a bit naive using uh, like uh, the session get and session set, kind of mm -hmm. reading them almost like variable. You know what I mean? Um, right, so, so you have a little global state, I guess? Yeah, that was basically what it was, but it, I wasn't doing it in like a smart way, if that makes sense. Like, I was doing it like, oh, the email thing is broken, and so when I, when this page leaves, you have to remember to make sure the email broken is back to false. You know what I mean? So, right, right. Like, there's kind of a lot of like spaghetti stuff that like, uh, that kind of goes away when, you, when you're when you forced to, uh, you know, set it up in a way, the way that Reframe asks. Right, so basically, like, it like provides you some structure right around how you yeah. build your app. Yeah, <laughs> discipline almost, but like that's imposed on you. Yeah, no, that's definitely valuable. Yeah, yeah. and I found, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing a bit more of developments of that because it looks really cool. Yeah, actually, the uh, Drew, uh, who's giving the presentation on Reframe, uh, he has like a 28-page slide, which has detailed diagrams and everything. It will blow your mind, but. Is he is here? Okay, because uh, oh, I was going to say he's on train, he might be late. <laughs> there he is, okay. All right, oh, so uh, Drew, uh, Drew uh, meet Dimitri. Dimitri is... Uh, Hi, Dimitri. Uh, Hi, how are you doing? ...to reagent ecosystem. Uh, okay, awesome. Yeah, uh, and he's looking forward to seeing your presentation, so... Okay. Uh, so yeah, I think... Uh, oh, by the way, just uh, uh, like a one minute... Uh, brief of the reagent history because you you were there in the beginning and you saw uh, you know reagent uh, evolve just can you give us a you know just of what happened last all oh, right yeah no, that's for sure so I guess like when I started using going back in the past so when I was evaluating on versus reagent I really really liked reagent right like I, I thought the model was really elegant it just it clicked it was simple uh, but then I looked at the GitHub repo and you know, like last commit was six months ago, which made me a little bit concerned, especially like, you know, if you're going to be invested in, in actually building apps with that. Mm -hmm. And I, I think a lot of other people have similar concerns about that. So I kind of, uh, I got, I posted, I guess, on the GitHub issues and started talking with Dan and Sean Carfield and a few other people. And I suggested that perhaps, you know, it might be better to move it to an organization on GitHub and then 
a few of us could share the load, right? Because if Ben's a busy guy, maybe some of us can help out and help keep the project moving. And Dan was really receptive about it. Like he's a really fantastic project maintainer, right? Can't stress him enough. And he was uh, really great at facilitating on that and moving stuff to GitHub and uh, to an art creation project and giving us access, that's on everything up for us. And I mean, he's been doing a fantastic job with the project, really. Like the other thing to note too that's really impressive about Reagent is that its API has pretty much stayed stable for over a year, right? Like we added stuff like cursors and a few other additions, uh, then made some performance improvements. But from user facing API, there's been practically no changes, right? There have been additions, but there's been no breaking changes, nothing. And even as React keeps updating to new versions, there's still no impact to reagent users. And this is really fantastic, right? Because like if you're investing in reagent, you know you don't have to worry about all those underlying things that are changing in the ecosystem. You're just targeting reagent, you update the version, and your app still works. And that that's really valuable to me, right? I mean that speaks to the quality of the design of the upfront design that Dan did. That the project is pretty much probably going to stay very similar in terms of APIs. That's not going to change. It's got the same thing with Closure, right? When Closure 1.0 came out, you can, you know, the API, like it's been evolving the and features, but the core API stayed the same. So, testament to good design, in my opinion. That's, that's awesome to hear. So, thank you so much, Dimitri. Uh, we love Absolutely. Thanks for having me, guys. We loved having you. I love your t shirt and hope to see you again. <laughs> and we'll be, maybe uh, one of us will be the speaker at your meetup. Oh, you want to uh, pitch your meetup? Or tell oh, yeah, absolutely. Meetup? So, yeah, we kind of uh, were having, uh, I guess, the general closure meetup in Toronto. And um, we've been focusing on reagent and closure script recently. So if any of you guys want to present, uh, kind of like do the same thing for us, it's really, really welcome. We love having the remote speakers. We had a few in the past and worked out really well. So we'd definitely love to hear from you. That'd be awesome. Okay, great, thank you. So we're, re we're ready for uh, Drew, I guess. Uh, right now. <laughs> okay, I guess I'll watch from the sidelines. <laughs> yeah, we're on Periscope, right? Okay, thanks for having me. Where should okay, I set up? Or with us? Hi everyone, my name is Drew. Um, I just started getting into the closure script and I've helped uh, build tutorials for Reframe, and that's what I'm going to present about today. Um, I work at Udacity, a little background about me, I've been there for under a year. Um, and like I said, I, I did my undergrad and master's at MIT, and I'm new to code scripts and been loving it so far. Um, so before I get into what Reframe is, and start telling you how great it is and how it's the next big thing, um, I'd, I'd like to talk about what Reframe isn't, because I think that's what makes it particularly unique. Um, what reframe is is magic. You just plug it in, type a variable here, everything just binds together and automatically works. Uh, it's not quite like that. Uh, it's not heavy. Everything is under 200 lines of code, very quick, so you can go through it in an afternoon and figure it out yourself or build your own version of it. It's not, I mean, when I think of other frameworks out there, you're getting into this huge, complex, heavy thing and you're really stuck with it. Reframe really isn't like that. And finally, it's not complex. Um, as this comes with it being small and lightweight. Um, this is a little picture of the tutorials on Angular. Notice there's 19 more pages to go there. Um, there will never be 20 pages worth of tutorials on Reframe. It's simple enough that you can dig in and figure it out yourself. So now that we've talked about what Reframe is, and let's get into what Reframe actually is. Um, I think about it as a simple organization for your closure script code based on Reagent. So if you're already using Reagent, um, it's just a set of best practices, potentially, that uh, tell you how you can organize your code better so others can use it. Uh, it comes with a set of utility functions to help you organize this code. Uh, like I said, it's less than 200 lines. And everything is built on top of Reagent. So if you use Reagent, you're comfortable with it, it plugs right in and it works really well. So um, let's pick a small toy problem to understand, first of all, how Reagent helps us. And we're going to see how, in many ways, Reframe is an extension of Reagent. And if we use the same concept from Reagent, we can actually derive the ideas behind Reframe. So the toy problem we're going to work on is a login form. And I, I pulled this straight from MailChimp.com. Uh, specifically, we're going to want to show and hide this little message. 
when you focus in, and only show it if your uh, username is invalid. Um, so before React and Reagent, how would we have done this? Well, we would have probably maintained two sets of states, um, whether the username is valid or not, and what the actual username is. Not so bad, but every time uh, someone inputs something new in that field, I now have to go and manually update that flag and update the username. Um, since this is a toy problem, this isn't that com like hard to maintain, but you can imagine if your view gets more and more complex, you're maintaining more and more different pieces of state, and you have to keep them in sync. And this can become a pain as time goes on. So now let's fast forward to what it looks like after React and Reagent. Um, what were the real ideas that helped make this problem easier to solve? Uh, for me, the main thing is it helped me think about my component view as just a function. I plug in the username, out comes the view. I don't have to worry about maintaining little pieces of state. When I type in new data, I just run that function again, and it, and it figures out what the actual view should be. So that's the big idea. Your view is a, your component's view is just a function. And there's no intermediate state that you have to trigger and, and mess around with. So what if we can extend this idea? Rather than just individual pieces as functions on data, what if we can say your entire view is a function? And I think this is the idea behind reframe. Right now we have our email is one function, username is one function, password is one function, but they're all not necessarily coordinated. Can we make the entire view one function by actually coordinating these different little mini views? And um, to give us one function so that you plug in data or state, out comes this entire view. And the way we're gonna do that is we're gonna maintain all our state in one place. That's the first thing we have to do. Because the idea is if you don't have state in one place, you can't just pass it into the function and out comes your view. Uh, you want one parameter, basically. So that brings us the first concept of reframe. Your, your, what what uh, the contributor calls, Mike calls the app DB, the single place where all your state is going to be maintained. And if you're already doing this in, re in Reagent, great. But in case you're not, it's one of the things that reframe strongly suggests and asks you to do. So um, the idea behind state in a single place is, in this example, I would have one R atom, which you've all seen in Reagent by now, hopefully. And uh, it has the individual fields I care about. If I want to get to another view, I just plug in a new piece of data into it. So every view, uh, every final view is accessible by plugging in a different state into my view function, basically. And the thing that I really like about this is the logic and the state are decoupled. So the logic of how I come up with my view isn't coupled with the actual state values I'm maintaining things. Uh, and this allows you to, to do a lot of cool things, which we're gonna see in a, in a second. So um, over here, if any of you have seen Elmline, I'm gonna play a short video by the creator of Elmline describing um, what, he, what he created, which is a time traveling debugger. Uh, the reason I'm playing this is because Reframe, Facebook Flux, all these ideas are heavily based off of Elmline, and really it's the same concept. He also has this idea of your state in one place, you plug it into this function, and out comes your view. Um, so we're gonna watch it really quickly. This example, just let this click continue. So if we click, we stamp them on the screen. And we can pause this and rewind through time. Excuse me. So quickly, what he's noticed, first of all, that his entire state is right here. He's keeping it in one place. And when he's rewinding, all he's doing is passing older values of the state back into his function. So one of the cool tricks you get with this decoupling. And let's move on to see how it becomes even cooler. And disappear, go forward in time. And understand here the actual position of all the stamps is listed, and the current mouse position at that time is listed. Now, if we move over to the code, we can change what our program is doing. So, here we want to change the size of our pentagon to be bigger, a lot bigger. Uh, or if we get tired of pentagons, we can just change that to maybe one octagon. Or so, what what this is showing is how he's able to change the logic behind his function, and he's able to pass those old pieces of state in and see what the new output looks like. He's able to treat these two things totally independently, and they're not coupled, and you can do all kinds of cool things with this. Um, so anything in the code can be switched around like this. Cool. So yeah, so um, what were the perks we saw? He's not worrying about state at all there. He's not trying to actively maintain things. You can hot swap your code in, your logic, and plug in the old pieces of state and get new views. 
and eventually you can do things like I'm doing. Um, those come up very quickly. Don't you pay uh, some sort of price for throwing in all the data that you might have in a form? If you're having a simple um, solution that you're building that mm -hmm. has a few data points, then fine, but if you were to be a very complex solution, and let me go very far with this. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's no, say no. it was a bank this application a with t tons of, of forms. Wouldn't it be more efficient to focus on a solution where you change based on each specific change during the application, not all what can happen yeah. at the same time? So I'm going to get to that in a second. That's a great question. Uh, won't this be slow if I have any sort of like really Leave complex? Questions. <laughs> uh, if I have any com kind of complex logic and I'm running this so-called function at every step, every time the state updates, it's like, am I going to go mad? And let's see, take a toy problem to understand why that would be. Um, let's say I'm building a Slack clone. Um, and let's say my AppDB or my Atom looks something like this. I have an app, it has conversations, conversations have messages, uh -oh. okay. and, and for each message, I calculate an unread count. And let's imagine for calculating the unread count, I go through every single message, check whether it's been read or not, and then sum it all up. So I'm basically iterating through all the messages, and this would suck if, let's say, um, I, this conversation here changes, and I'm recalculating every single unread count. So what I really need is a way to say only when the messages for this given thing change, recompute the unread count. And um, so what it would look like is something like messages change, okay, now recompute that. So that's what I need, and um, this is what subscriptions allow us to do. Uh, and this is built into Reframe. So um, it comes from the ideas already in Reagent. So Reagent's already doing this for us when it's saying, how do I know to re-render this view? Like, how do I know that it has to be updated? It's keeping track of these R atoms and seeing when they're changed and not changed. And we're going to reuse the exact same ideas they have there. Um, a subscription uses the concept of a reaction. Um, and so let's say you have this atom that has this value, has a property counter, it starts at 1. Um, you can define a reaction, which is exactly what you were saying. Only when this changes, um, this will get updated. So we'll say it's going to be counter plus 1. Right? And so initially it will start, if that's 1, this is going to be 2. As soon as I swap out the value of that 1 to be 2, this is going to update to be 3. And this, this comes with reagent. If you're using reagent, you have access to this function right now. This isn't a property of reframe. Um, and so we can do very interesting things with this. Um, they return R atom like data structures, so you can build reactions on top of reactions. You can plug these directly into your reagent views. Um, and now let's let's take a quick second and understand why these are different from cursors. Because cursors also achieve a lot of this functionality of scoping down this big atom into a piece you care about. Um, the main difference that I see is that reactions are based on functions, whereas cursors are based on pointers into your atom. So, a reaction is a function that outputs a new value. It's a map on your original atom. And so that means it's an immutable view. You change the map, nothing's going to happen to the source. The cursor, if you change the cursor, you might be messing up with your original atom. So, and you can also do more interesting things with a function, potentially, than you could just with the cursor. So think about why a map is useful versus just an, a pointer into your data structure, and that will give you an idea of why I think reactions are potentially a good tool. And just to try to clarify a bit for myself in my mind, I would say that the way that the cursors work is kind of like uh, how um, in a browser you have DOM, how uh, in, in a node can be uh, pointing to its sub nodes, and mm -hmm. you know it can have all that problems that you have in the in the DOM when you detach one node, but it doesn't necessarily get detached. You have a pointer to it, and other different problems that have to do with mutability. Is that right? Yes, okay. I think that sounds about right. Okay. Um, so let's take question. Yes. So I was wondering uh, if you have all of your app scapes in one structure. Yeah. And um, so I'm, my understanding is if it's kind of like working on reagent, uh, yeah. where you're triggering a re-render every time the parent is uh, modified. Yeah. So you could have a situation where you have like um, sibling components. Mm -hmm. And whenever one sibling changes, the root node is modified. And yeah. So you're actually uh, <coughs> triggering re-renders for uh, all the siblings, sure. even though only one sibling was modified. Sure. Yeah. Right. So, but for the virtual DOM, not for the actual DOM, um, in this case, like the 
react with the <coughs> gatekeeper. Yeah, but you're I still doing the diff on the virtual download, right? <coughs> yeah. so, I mean, so the way around that is to subscribe to just the piece you care about and not subscribe to the to the parent of the attribute. So you would say, I care about only this property, create a reaction that just outputs this R atom, plug that R atom into your uh, component. Mm -hmm. And so now it's totally isolated from everything else. So the, ref so the reference changes are not propagated up to uh, No. No, they're not propagated up. Yeah, so sorry, that's something I should have mentioned. Curses, no bubbling. Yeah, curses do pop propagate up these uh, ones. So let's think about what we have so far. We figured out we store our app state our, into one main atom. We have subscriptions to get pieces of that out. And then we plug these into our reagent views because there are atoms and we can use them as such. And I think this has gotten us close to the idea of one piece of state you plug into a function, out comes your view. And only the parts of the mm -hmm. function that need to be recomputed are recomputed. So now how do you actually update this data? So you have your view. Your view ideally is something that changes over time. And the way we're going to do that is using dispatchers. And a dispatcher is just an eventing system. So if you're Facebook, you have a like button, you hit someone clicks on it, all the view is going to say is someone clicked on post one. And it's just going to send out an event, and it's going to do no more than that. And the reason I believe that uh, Reframe chooses this idea is because the views don't have to worry about how to update the data. They just say, something happened, someone else deal with it. Mm -hmm. And so now let's, think, now let's see who deals with it. It's the handler. This is another organizational component that uh, Reframe suggests. Uh, a handler is going to take in an event, so something like post one got clicked. It's going to take in the current app state, and it's going to come out with a new app state. So it's a, in many ways, you can think of it as a reduce. Taking a new value outputs uh, a new state. And so something for uh, dealing with clicks might look like uh, create a handle, handle like function, um, take in the post ID, and then look at the clicks attribute and increment it by one. So that's all it's going to do. And so now that we've seen a decent life cycle of what reframe is, and we've come up with the ideas behind it, Let's take a look at what some of the code actually looks like. Um, I ported over the Angular PhoneCat tutorial, if any of you have seen that, into mm -hmm. Reframe so that I could understand it more. Um, so I'm going to show you some of the code and how it looks. Uh, we're going to deal with three pieces to start with, the dispatcher, handler, and the main atom. And we're going to start by how do you initialize uh, your app state. So let's say you have some data you want it to be, uh, you have some scaffolding data you want it to start out as. Um, the way you would do this is you would use a dispatcher to initialize it. So let's say you have an init function at the bottom where you, where you say uh, render my overall view. I've omitted some things to make it simpler. So, uh, but in that function, you would say dispatch out this event, initialize the database. You would want to write a handler now that deals with that. So you'd handle it. And if we remember, handler takes in the event, current app state, outputs a new app state. So it would be something like you would say reframe register handler the event name, and then a function that actually um, taken the event and the app and output a new app state. And so here, all we're doing is we're just releasing a new atom. That's all it's doing. So now let's take a look at subscriptions. Given we have now this initial atom, how do we actually subscribe to parts of it? Um, this is going to look like this. We're going to, let's say we want to register to the phones property of my data structure, the list of phones that um, are in my database. So you would say, reaction, get the phones out of the DB. So it's just a simple function, um, nothing crazy. Here we're using it much like a pointer, but you can do more interesting things. And for your reagent view, how would you, you would use it is you would say like let phones equal, or let phones be subscribed with phones. And that would give you that atom. And so uh, let's take a look at a potentially more complex reaction, because I want, I want to communicate that it's not just a pointer, it can do more interesting things. Uh, so let's say you care about, you want a pointer, or you want uh, the value of the selected image in this view. So someone can click one of these thumbnails and select one. And if no one's clicked on anything yet, we want it to default to the first image in that list. Okay, it's a pretty simple idea. Um, so if, if image is not selected, it's the first image, otherwise it's the selected image. Um, so what we might do is, uh, it would be a, uh, we'll register a subscription and we'll take in a phone ID. That's what this is doing right here. Uh, so we take in a phone ID, we get the phone, the phone atom from our database, 
Um, and then we get the images. So images is just going to get be a reaction images property on the phone. And we're going to output a reaction that says if if the selected image URL is set, that's what an if let does, then let it be the image URL. Otherwise, just give me the first image. So basically, if this guy's already null, um, I mean, if this guy's not null, then give, give me back an image URL. That means someone's clicked on something. Otherwise, give me back the first image. So there's nothing too interesting going on here, but the point is you can have more interesting reactions that automatically update themselves than just simple pointers. So now, how would I actually use this um, subscription? Um, let's say I want to actually show this thumbnail view. What will the, what will the reagent view look like? Um, let's say I have a phone page component. I've simplified it to make this a little easier to understand, hopefully. I get the image URL out by calling subscribe with uh, the subscription name I created, selected image URL. I pass in the phone ID that I care about. Let's say this one is Motorola Zoom or something. Um, and then I have my render function. And all it's going to do is it's image source at image URL slash phone. So at image URL is referring to the subscription, um, to what the subscription returned me. What's interesting here is now whenever the selected image URL changes, this view is going to be rendered. And so I have something that I believe is responsive. So now let's say now we want to send out events. So let me show you a quick example of what that looks like. Uh, here's the thumbnails view. You want to click on a thumbnail, you want it to be the main image, the selected image. All we're going to do is add this on click, dispatch an event, set image to be image. So the view logic is very simple. All it has to do is say, someone click me. You someone else deal with it. And so um, now we've seen all the main pieces of reframe. We've seen that you have a main atom. You can subscribe to pieces of that main atom. You have views. You plug in the subscription into the views. And the views just dispatch events. And then the handler deals with that to start a new cycle, basically. And why do I think this is cool? It's because I think it gets us really close to a truly reactive front end. So let's take the let's take the idea that someone was messing with the, the phones in the back end and they changed the first image of one of the phones. So the Motorola Zoom image changed from this to this. They changed the image URL. How is our view how is our application going to respond to that? Well, the image URL subscription is going to change because it was based on the phone. It was a reaction on phones, so when phones changed, our image URL recomputed it and updated itself. And as a result, since we plugged in that atom into the uh, reagent view, the view itself is going to re-update. So what you have is someone changes the data, the entire view re-updates based on what needs to be updated. So these are, I think, the main benefits of using something like Reframe. It allows you to think about how to create truly responsive applications. Um, they're hopefully simple to understand and use because the library is so small. Um, and it's made for reagents. So if you like using reagents, it's very easy to get started with it. Um, so if you want to learn more about these, I'm by no means the authoritative source. You should go check out the source code. It's really small, like I said. Um, other things to check out are, you can check out my PhoneCat tutorials which compare side by side what something would look like in Angular versus uh, Reframe. And finally, I would really suggest looking at Elmer. Um, I think he's the guy who deserves a lot of the credit with these ideas, and Facebook Flux now gets all the credit, but uh, he comes up with a lot of these cool ideas, and he's written papers and papers on it, so that's the source, and Facebook Flux has presented this, the same concept again and again. Uh, so yeah, if you want to contact me or ask me any questions, my email is through Vediracity. I have a Twitter handle, but I don't really use it that much, <laughs> uh, and my GitHub is through P. So thank you. Uh, are there any questions? Um, yeah. I just want to close up on the last part that's confusing me. Yeah. Is uh, with uh, what you pointed out with giving in, uh, so an event happens, mm -hmm. and the, the dispatcher or the handler says, okay, an event happened, here's the data for the event. Mm -hmm. and I'm going to attach the app data, the app DB if you want, mm -hmm. to that to get it and get the new app DB and save it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so that's all about the immutability and pretty much how closure works. I'm just curious about um, exactly what you pointed there about performance-wise. Is is it really what I'm supposed to expect when I'm using the frame is that when those events happen, I'm actually going in the code to have a whole process, like one, one step of instruction that is going to go ahead, fetch all the data that could be really big, and then do an, a small manipulation onto it, and then 
perform those all those subtractions and the dispatches that are internally happen when you do one change into that uh, app DB state. Okay. So, I, I, so what was the specific question there? Yeah, it, it, so if, if, if we really am to expect that this huge change, that the whole chunk of the app to be is, is given out to be changed by one single event, by one small. Yeah, I mean, it's, the app to be is, the entire like, data structure is passed into all these functions, but I don't think that's cost because it's just a pointer to some value somewhere. Um, I, yeah, I don't, I don't see that as being particularly expensive. One, one interesting thing about reframe is that it short circuits the data flow. So if, if, you, um, if you have, say, something subscribed to each thing in the list, um, when you update that list somehow, and you also have a subscription on the, the parent, uh, the parent will sort of get notified, like, oh, something changed. Um, but each of only the the one child that that got changed will have its um, subscriptions triggered because each of the other children sort of evaluates to be the same thing as it used to be, and so it, it short circuits at that point in the tree. Yeah. So, so it's doing the reference check, like it's doing yeah. the not equal to equal to. So it's three events. So, so just to try to throw an example for me to understand better. Say I have uh, an event that changes two data points, two data attributes of the whole app uh, DB, uh -huh. um, and so it does those changes, but it only needs one of those changes to present a change in the view part that is associated to it. Okay. Okay. So it does the, the view rendering, the, that element, the child, and all of its subchild, they get re rendered. But later on, if it had some event of the parent or the parent of the parent, and that second data attribute that was changed by that child at the first event, mm -hmm. uh, if it's associated to it. So what happened is we kind of set the data beforehand to be ready to be relevant for the parent whenever that parent's event uh, is, uh, is uh, dispatched, you know, the subscriptions for that happen to happen. So it, it kind of like saves a step by having the app to be set up ready for whatever needs to be related to that knowledge only if and when it needs to read that information from the FDB. Yeah, so I, I wasn't able to follow the full question, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, so you have the parent and it has a tribute, it, it listens to attribute A, B, and C. Okay. And a child uh, attribute, I'm talking about the view, okay? The okay, actual view listens to A, B, and C, okay. Yeah, so A, B, C. And the child of that parent, uh, it deal, it, the, the rendering takes in the data from C and D. Okay. okay. Or I'm uh, sorry, just sorry. Actually, just D. Sorry, just D. Just D. Okay. But you have an event that changes for C and D, and there's and the event uh, pushes the the subscription saying, okay, D changed. So for the child's view, we render it, and it takes the data from the D attribute, mm -hmm. but doesn't take it from C. Okay. We did change C later on in the application. Some event is dispatched. Okay. That causes a re-rendering of the parent node. Okay that reads from C and another different data. Um, so because the data the data attribute C was updated from that child, from the previous event, yeah. so we kind of saved the step for re, uh, for re um, what's the word I'm looking for? For uh, resetting the value for that new re-rendering event for the parent. Yeah, that sounds right. Um, I think additionally what, what you ideally want to do is have each uh, part of your view broken down so that they're subscribing to the smallest at, like piece of data possible. If they're subscribing to more data than they need to be, then whenever any other parent of that data changes, they're going to re-render. You want them to only change when the specific piece of data you care about changes. So that's that's one way to make it hopefully feel better. Yeah. So I was a little curious about uh, you mentioned that. Uh, yeah. Um, so if you are subscribed to, so I mean, if I think of my app DB as a tree, yeah, and um, each of these, um, I don't know what's the analog of cursor, but each of those is like a, a node in the tree, uh -huh. and if each of my views is subscribed to like a particular set of nodes, uh -huh. and so only when those specific nodes get modified, only then those corresponding like it, only then it gets re-entered. Yeah. 
And so it doesn't matter like if anything below or above it <coughs> gets changed. Only when that exact node gets modified, only then. That well, if the children of that node get modified, doesn't it count as the that node also is modified? Because um, the node is the its children and itself together. Well, I mean, so it, it depends. So, for example, if you have like a profile uh, component, yeah. Or, or like a user component that contains like some profile information like your username and your, I don't know, your address or something. Okay. And then you have something else like um, maybe your geolocation or the number of likes you receive in the photos. And so your user component would have all that information. Okay. But then your username or your address is not changing. Like yeah. it's more static. Yeah. But if your geolocation, like if there's a map component under the user that yeah. has the geolocation and your likes, those change. So even though the user is kind of listening to like a user node, so yeah. it kind of can change this, but, if, but because it's not listening to geolocation or likes, only those children components get re-entered. Like the entire user uh, component will get re-entered. Is that correct? No, I think. I think when you change the properties of an object, at least in, in reframe, mm -hmm. the reaction is going to rerun. So it doesn't matter. So if if the if the user has a property of the geolocation, mm -hmm. username, password, mm -hmm. whatever, mm -hmm. you change any one of password, username, mm -hmm. or uh, geolocation, mm -hmm. it'll mm -hmm. it'll see that the user object has changed, okay. and it'll it'll. Uh, so I guess like Mono, like as I think he mentioned, like if you have like a banking application where you have a lot. Yeah. And if you kind of wrap them up into like one root component, yeah. Uh, wouldn't that end up triggering render like the virtual deaths for a lot of uh, a lot of the children? Right. So that's when you don't re you you don't want your reagent use listening. I mean, using the entire app state ever. Okay. You want to subscribe to the piece the small piece that you care about. So let's say um, your your bank account has um, your balance as one of its attributes. If you have a view that's just responsible for displaying balance that view only takes in or subscribes to that balance property and nothing more. And then you won't have the proper problem of something else changes my, all my views are re-rendered. Yeah. Uh, easy question, do you, when will you dust the hammer force like functional programming in Clojure and will you teach it? Uh, yeah, if we do, I don't know. <laughs> right now the market wants like Angular and stuff. <laughs> so if you want a job, don't, don't learn Clojure. <laughs> 1.0 or 2.0? One point zero, two point zero. Oh, no, zero. Like, that's that's everyone's slow. following you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But oh, yeah, yeah. Point zero. I mean, the yeah. interesting thing to note, though, is that a lot of these ideas are you can implement them in JavaScript today, and I've been doing that at my job. So, the concept of R atoms and streams that change over time and subscribing to that, you can use RxJS, and that's what I've been doing. Um, RxJS allows you to create a stream of values. You can map over them to create these this concept of reactions. Um, the idea of immutable data structures. Facebook has an immutable JS library to give you closure uh, style uh, immutable data structures. So um, these ideas don't exist just in the closure script vacuum. Right, yeah, it's a lot prettier to do it in closure script. It's a lot prettier, but yeah. you can still do it. So uh, you're, you're going, if I understand correctly, you're go this is kind of going for uh, communicating between components by subscriptions, right? The, the, the components don't actually, they communicate by sending out events. They don't communicate to each other. They send all their information to the main app state, mm -hmm. and then that flows down. The changes flow down. So they're never talking to each other. Really. Mm -hmm. So if reactions, so, so oh, no. if reactions don't bubble up, right? Yeah. Do you end up having to nest subscriptions? Or? Yeah, you, you have to change, change the subscription. Um, so it's a little more upfront work than a cursor. A cursor is like you don't have to write all these reactions. I, I have other another really important question about uh, reusable components or recon, and, but, but you know we'll get to it. We'll okay. Hear it um, so there's there's another closure library that's supposed to be inspired by Elm called Zelkova or something. Have, oh. you, have you heard of that? No, no. Uh, Zelkova. Z e l k o v a. I don't know. I haven't checked it out. Oh, okay. That's really interesting. Have you looked at this JavaScript library called Mercury? No, I haven't checked it out. What is that called? Mercury, like the metal. So apparently that's pretty much like a JavaScript version of Elm. Oh, wow. Yeah. 
I mean, I think Facebook Plus is basically, they, if you look at their slides, they copied out parts of the Emlang stuff. And like the same architecture is what Facebook Plus is. And so they're also going for the same concept. And their view is React, our view is Reagent. Reactions are really interesting. Are they uh, in any way the basis for Kershaw's and, and reagents? Um, I don't Because they exist in, in reagents. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, so one question about reframe, the reason I haven't really jumped into it at first, with all the excitement around it is, uh, uh, Mike said in his first post that the, you know, the uh, handlers, basically handlers are outs outside of the component function. Mm -hmm. Yeah, component functions and all that. And then you have the handlers outside. Now, if you want to build reusable components uh, where handlers say uh, implement uh, uh, CSS uh, transitions based on, like when the user you know uh, focuses the input field, you have the on focus handler uh, switch CSS classes to do some transition, right? So if you were building those kinds of components which we have, uh, and you're tra you're basically sharing the component. Uh, with its transitions, there is no way then to put the handlers yeah. on it. Yeah, and then you're sharing meaningful functionality as opposed to like uh, you're doing the abstraction correctly. No, I mean, so yeah, there's a tension between value and correctness, in, in, in my opinion. Like the architecture of uh, using cursors may not be as correct as the architecture of using subscriptions and mm -hmm. reactions, but we're able to encapsulate, you know, uh, value in the components that we share within the, you know, across the team. But so I'm just, yeah. Sounds uh, like he has it. As it related. One thing you could do is have a, like a, a components uh, area in your um, in your app, right? So so you have a namespace that will say for, for this profile view. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it needs to know whatever, how many votes this guy has, right? Mm -hmm. So you could actually, um, you know, have like a, uh, you can register handlers and subscriptions um, alongside the view, right? Sure. Like in the same place. Sure. So I feel like I kind of. But well, can you put them in a jar and deploy them and share them on, on closures? Uh, or will you be incorporating application specific logic? Like you don't want right. to incorporate right. application like specific logic. Like you make a library out of one of these. But, but there's a, a, a useful edge case of where handlers are actually implementing CSS transitions, you know, when you like focus, when you hover, then it changes class, it does these things. Um, and then that requires a different architecture than what Reframe uh, is, you know, suggesting. I'm not sure how, uh, if it's less than 200 lines of code, uh, it may be, you know, pliable. Well, sorry, what is it that? So the question is, how can you package um, you know, animation, you know, CSS animation functionality, state driven, app state driven, CSS transitions with the components that are dependent on handler definitions being shipped with the component, not existing outside well, of the you know, then you also have to ship the CSS with the thing as well, right? No, well, well, the CSS uh, can exist in um, the way we're doing it internally, and this is not a universal scheme for sh uh, shareable components, but internally, we have something called the vault that holds uh, versions, style, classes, right? And then uh, we have equivalent user classes that can override the vault because they come later in the, in the, in the you know, CSS sequence. And uh, we found out that, you know, uh, this is a good way to uh, give you flexibility to customize everything, including the animations and transitions and power look and feel. But at the same time, when you pull the component in your project, the vault is supplied with all of our applications. It's pulled into all of our applications, and it's ready to use. So, um, yeah, so yeah. I'm trying to basically discuss with Mike once he's done with the recom um, effort, which you know absorbed a lot of his time, how to make and components that have these transition and uh, transitions in, in a recom. Yeah, and I'm sure he's going to work out something. You know. Yeah, cool. I mean, you're right. That yeah. is the limitation. Yeah. It's really, really interesting. I think we probably should dig into reactions and understand them better. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Awesome, awesome presentation. I think. Okay, we, quick uh, question. Yeah. So I was wondering that in this architecture, it seems like um, your store uh, is kind of has a like an internal binding, so to speak, uh, between the random and the view. 
I was wondering, so like before I actually knew about Flux or you know this mm -hmm. architecture, the way I had like done implemented this on my own was have like a like a single event bus, like a dispatcher. Yeah. But instead of having uh, the views, in, in addition to the views, publishing updates and the models subscribing to it, mm -hmm. uh, what I was doing was I was when once the models uh, updated, they would publish an update event. Mm -hmm. And the views would kind of subscribe to those mm -hmm. update events. So I'm wondering, like, is there any particular difference in those two approaches, or is there, like, do you see any benefit? Or any so, yeah, I mean, that, so that's a good question. Could you have your model publish out events saying I've changed? Right. Um, but I think what I like about Reframe is you don't have to write all that eventing architecture because you're using uh, immutable data structures to know if a value has actually changed. You just check is the old value different from the new value. And a reaction is doing that under the hood. Is it, it says, it only runs if it says, okay, has this changed? Okay, now I run this function again. Um, so you really don't need to write any of that um, logic that's as event driven. Um, but other than the extra code, is it like, is, do you see any other uh, drawbacks? No, okay. um, that sounds fair what you're doing. So, uh, so you guys want to get started again, and then we can talk afterwards. It's just a lot. Um, so basically, this is um, the loyal three sign-up page without the header, the footer, and with a debug section I added um, to show the uh, interaction between two components. Uh, actually, more than two components. These are these are f uh, five components here. Uh, five divs that display the results, and five divs that are going to right back to the input field. So it's two-way interactivity between uh, multiple components. Um, first, let me, sh let me explain the architecture, app architecture at Loyal3 and how we ended up here. And uh, then you can rationalize about a lot of the decisions we, we made. We actually have microservices on the back end and micro SPAs on the front end. A micro SPA is defined as being Maximally, you know, two, three, four pages. It, uh, because we have a microservices architecture, you know, they're, they basically there's a lot of sharing between those services, a lot of coordination between the services on the back end. So the uh, so the front end applications don't really need to talk to each other. Like the the coordination happens on the back end, and um, with the idea of our apps being less than 500 lines of uh, reagent code, uh, we don't have the same issues as people dealing with thousands of lines of uh, closure script, right? So we uh, scale does uh, change the nature of the problem. So that's a, you know uh, the st uh, starting decision. Uh, the other decision we made is that we want to actually develop the site in terms of components, and we want those components to be reused across teams. We have four or five teams, you know, and we want to be able to put the components in our internal version of Clojars. It's called Artifactory, if you have heard of it. It's a Maven repo manager. And um, build a pipeline such that every time the component is update and updated in, in GitHub, in our you know, private GitHub, uh, Team City would kick off a pipe, uh, a built pipeline that uh, eventually, you know, that run the test and puts it into Artifactory, and then um, we define, um, we just pull it in our project CLJ, uh, CLJ basically, and um, like here, let me show you the project CLJ of this pro, uh, where we're requiring the component is right here. That's all. And then we uh, reference the namespace and uh, are able to use that component. So it's all automated, and um, it's actually a pretty nice way of building sites. Uh, we only have the current version and the previous version of every component. So if we have 10 applications, we don't have 10 versions of component of the same component. We made sure that we um, manage uh, manage it in a realistic way. So what do these components do that make, make them uh, worthy of reuse or worthy of sharing? I mean, what is an input box? An input box doesn't do much, and why would you want to share an input box? Um, unless it did something that was hard to recreate, uh, you know, costly to recreate 
every time you build an app. So the first thing is the transitions on state changes. And what I mean by that is uh, this is focus. So the focus state has changed, and the animation gets triggered. Uh, by the handler that's packaged with the component. Uh, same thing with errors, you know. Um, the errors, um, basically, um, what happens is the app has validation logic, and if the in input fails validation, it's going to write to the app DB, uh, to the app Atom, and uh, the components are going to react to the error state and the app state. And so everything is really app state driven. All the transitions are app state driven. We write to app state and we react. Um, and um, one thing, you know, we, c we can do things like this. This is, you know, a component reacting to the input here and we can change, the out change it again. So it's two way, two -way react reactivity. Um, I think the, one of the learning lessons in animation was um, how you would work with uh, CSS transition group on uh, mount and unmount. Uh, previously, what we had done, what I had done, you know, in this component was uh, we would let the uh, value of of the error message uh, that every error message here is a par, you know, a p element. So we would set transitions on the p element when the error state changes. But then, if the error message goes to nil. For both of them, what would happen, this would jump, you know, because they're basically uh, rear agent would re render it, and re render it with empty content, so it jumps even and then runs the transition. So the transition is kind of useless, right? So the way React uh, deals with this is with the CSS transition group. So don't basically, uh, instead of setting the uh, um, value of the, you know, element to nil, you would. Um, Specify CSS transition group on mount and unmount so that um, it and 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 you would either display it or you remove it or remove it and removing it means it's it gets unmounted. So in will will mount and um, will unmount you have your um, you know callbacks to run it uh, and, and CSS transition group is very easy to work with and I think it's been demonstrated with reagent on the mailing list as of today somebody posted about it. Uh, but we, you know, uh, went through different hacks to get here. You know, the first hack was like, hey, instead of setting the uh, uh, content to nil, uh, just change the font to transparent. <laughs> and, you know, this way you don't get the jump, right? So we did a lot of, uh, you know, hacky thinking around it, and then eventually it settled on the CSS transition group. That was, I think, the biggest lesson in using uh, Reagent for animations. Um, the other lesson was... Um, to have uh, the vault styles, what I was talking about earlier. The CSS styles are versioned in something we call the vault. And so the vault would have R stands for re reagent, input placeholder, and you know this is the current version. This is SAS. So if you can read SAS, this is very obvious what it's doing. And so we have all these styles, including the animations. Um, you know, you've got the WebKit transform and all of that stuff in here. And um, in addition to the system or vault classes that all applications have, we have the user classes. Um, and the user classes, if you look at the spec element, the user classes, I think this is too small, but I, I don't know. Too okay. You have to hang up because I've got to answer from the, the phone. So the user uh, classes would be. Uh, no, 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 no. no. This is the vault class followed by the user class. So if you, your application can always specify a user class to override the vault class. And so our developers, only component developers touch the vault classes uh, to update the component. But individual developers using the component, they can override it with the equivalent user class. Um, also, we didn't include, uh, we're not grid-based, but we do breakpoint and responsive. So we didn't include the breakpoints in the vault because every application has different breakpoint uh, set of breakpoints. Um, let's see, what else did we learn from this? Oh, working with artifactory and local uh, Maven repos as opposed to pushing to closures because of uh, you know intellectual property reasons and you know company policy, we don't want to push the components to in, in public, and so we had to figure out 
really uh, how to work with Linigan and Artifactory so that Linigan can de deploy to Artifactory. And Artifactory has a Team City plugin and all that. There's just a, a ton of stuff that we're going to blog about at some point in the near future to describe the full setup. And you know, we'll provi provide also a GitHub repo that will include a simple example of using one of the components. It may not be this specific one. Um, our one of our inspiration points was uh, Material UI. Material UI actually has a lot of these fancy animations, and we wanted to, you know, come close to it um, or be, you know, do something better. And uh, you know, things like Semantic UI and and and, and Material UI gave us idea idea for having uh, reusable components that did something fun and made the UI more engaging and that. It will have always the same consistent look and feel. And so if we build 20 applications, you know, we have a lot of applications. We have like FPO application, proxy application, simple reg, this, that, you know, a ton of them almost every day we have a different application um, to build out our site. And if they didn't use reusable components, you know, you'd, I don't know how we would make them this engaging. Uh, and I don't know how we would maintain the same style and, you know, uh, same code, code base. So all of this is using cursors. I'll give you an idea of uh, the structure. So we have a file we call ratom.cljs in every project, or that's the standard we're converging to. And basically, this is simple reg. Simple registration is a very simple app. It's under 300 lines of code. And so the uh, state structure for it is extremely simple. Uh, the uh, kind of cursors that it uh, exposes are, these are the cursors that are expected by the reusable input and the app. The app writes to, um, I mean, the app writes to the errors because we don't have, uh, uh, you know, responsibility for grabbing the data inside each component. The, apps, gr the app grabs the data, puts it in the app state, the components react to it, but the, um, you know, so basically the component and the app expect these cursors. So they're like an API to state, is how I think of it, you know. Um, with the export uh, meta tag, we can make sure advanced compilation doesn't uh, munch the names and stuff, so we can actually, um, and we can actually access it. Um, let me show you how we define these things. So form is being required as, um, you know, form is loyal3.form over here. I just put the form here for testing, but usually it's loyal3.ui.form as form. And then the way we use it is this, because we had exposed these, you know, input password is made of uh, basically a a an input component with type password. That's all it is. And, um, you know, split text, input split, uh, text split, could be you know three, four, five, whatever. Over here is two. Um, it's made of two input text components, um, and so um, it's really very um, easy to call these. And the way we call them from our apps is form input text, and we give it. Uh, in this case, it has two fields: first name, last name. We also have to pass it the uh, state namespace. Uh, because every project can have different file structure and can call. Uh, mostly, you know, we call it right on the CLJS, but some projects may call it something else. So when we pass the namespace, it, uh, the, the component can access that and access the cursors. So that's our interface to app state through cursors that are, uh, you know, namespaced, but can be, the namespace can be passed in. Um, and that's really... That's really it. This is uh, how we use it. This is the form element itself, um, having you know the, defining the input, and, and this is the interface to it. So um, we can achieve all that kind of engaging functionality we want to achieve without having to go to uh, you know a better or greater or more correct abstraction. In fact, we actually we haven't run into anything with cursors right now that you know makes them bad. So when uh, Reframe came out and says, don't use cursors. I was like, what's wrong with cursors? You know, I still really don't understand what's wrong with them because we haven't run into any problem with them. 
So we're just, you know, being pragmatic. Like if we run into a problem with them, then we're like, oh, okay, let's rethink this approach. But part of the reason we have the meetups and stuff is to bring, you know, great minds together and so we can all learn, you know. And so I'm really interested in any uh, critical feedback or critical questions you have, including if you have them now, maybe. <laughs> that's, uh, that's pretty much it.